So I'm here at Dueling Brown's Distillery outside of north of Nashville. I'm in Kentucky and uh, doing another harvest host, another harvest host. Sitting out here in, the, in their lot and I've got my solar out, which I'm probably gonna put away because the sun's not on it anymore and it's not gonna be too cool tonight, so I don't need to hook up the generator. I'm gonna make some barbecue pulled pork. Mac and cheese. About five miles south of here, you're gonna run into a horse track called Kentucky Downs. It was built in the 1990s, but it was originally called a dueling grounds race course. The reason being is back in the early 1800s, excuse me, there was a farm on that property where they held pistol duels. Uh, the farm was called Lincoln Pinch Farm, so there's where the name of the bourbon comes from. And Lincoln Pinch Farm hosted over 40 duels in its day. Uh, most of them were between attorneys and politicians settling <laughs> cases out of the courts. <laughs> Uh, the most famous duel that happened here was in 1826. Uh, it was fought by Sam Houston, the same guy from Texas history. Uh, did, at this point, he was living in Nashville as a representative of Tennessee. And he got into a debate with one of his opponents over who was going to be the postmaster of Nashville. Very important topic. Uh, so that's kind of where our background comes from. Uh, although as a distillery, we are very new. We opened in September of 2016, just a little over five years ago. So we're pretty, pretty recent. Uh, that's kind of where the whole background history part comes in. The first rule of bourbon is that it has to be made in the United States. Uh, it does not have to come from Kentucky. It's a common misconception. Bourbon does not have to be made in Kentucky. Uh, it does have to be made in the United States. Uh, we do make pretty much all of it. About 90% of all bourbon is made in Kentucky. But all 50 states have distilleries that make bourbon. And that includes uh, Alaska and Hawaii. So there you go, two for one. You do have to make it in the United States. The second rule is that bourbon has to be made from a minimum of 51% corn. And whatever you come up with as far as your recipe goes, that's your mash bill, as they say. For example, ours is 66% corn, 22% wheat, and 12% malted barley, which we'll kind of get more into later. All right? The third rule involves barrels. Bourbon barrels have to be made of oak. can be any other type of wood. Uh, the law doesn't specify what type of oak, uh, but everybody uses American white oak, which we'll talk more about later. The barrels also have to be charred on the inside, which we'll get into as well. But probably most importantly, you can only use a new barrel. Once you dump a barrel of bourbon, you can't use that barrel again for bourbon. You can only use a new barrel for bourbon. Number four involves alcohol content. There you go. So uh, for bourbon, the initial spirit, the raw spirit that comes off our still, that can't be higher than 160 proof, 80% alcohol. Uh, yeah, a lot. But when you put it in the barrel, you can't put it in higher than 125, 62.5%. Uh, you lower it just by adding water. When you bottle bourbon, there's no maximum. You can bottle it however high it comes out of the barrel at, but you can't bottle it below 80 proof. 40. Last but not least, number five, and that's bourbon can't have anything added to it besides water. No flavorings, no colorings, no sugars, no preservatives, nothing but water. Time that you make alcohol, you have to have sugar for fermentation, but you can't just dump a bunch of sugar in there. Uh, you have to get it from a different source depending on what you're making. If you're making whiskey, it's the grains. The first thing that's going to happen is the grains are going to get crushed into sort of a coarse mill. Uh, that's going to expose the starch. Next thing we have to do is we have to cook those grains in water to dissolve the starches. So we're going to fill this thing up with water, and we're going to heat it all the way up to 190 degrees using steam. Now, not every grain starch dissolves at the same temperature. Some starches are tougher than others. The strongest one we're working with is the corn. It has to go in first, cook at 190 degrees for 45 minutes. Once it's done, we're going to lower the temperature down to 165 degrees, and that's when the next grain goes in, which is like wheat. Now, that's sort of uncommon. Most bourbons use rye as the second grain. You're not going to see wheat very often. The main reason we use wheat is because being a small distillery, we wanted to buy local. It is very difficult to grow rye in Kentucky. Rye is more of a cold climate crop. Okay? Doesn't grow very well around here. But guess what does grow around here? Wheat. 
And so we went with wheat for that reason. Yeah. We use wheat mainly so we can buy local, but we also use wheat because it does change the flavor profile. Rye tends to be a bit spicy and herbal. Wheat tends to be a bit sweet and dry. Think of the difference between rye bread and wheat bread. It's not the same thing when you're talking about wheat. Now, the wheat goes in, it only takes about 10 minutes to cook, and when it's done, we will yet again lower the temperature down to 145 degrees, and that's when the malted barley will in. You don't see a whole, a big percentage of malted barley in bourbon usually, but you pretty much always see it in bourbon, and there's a reason for that. Yeah, malted barley contains enzymes, namely uh, one called alpha amylase. The enzymes in malted barley help the starches convert into sugars. Without it, you would have to add an enzyme solution, at which point you wouldn't be making bourbon. Um, every every starch has a different, what's called um, saccharification temperature, which is, so starches are contained within a semi-permeable membrane, and the different grain starches, those membranes burst at different temperatures. Well, you don't want to put them in too high, otherwise it'll burst and like destroy the starch. And so you have to put it in a different temperature, so that way you can burst those starches, but you don't destroy them. You just want them to dissolve in the water, that way when you put in the enzymes, it can convert them into sugar. Yeah. Now once all that's said and done, we don't have any alcohol yet. What we have is a grainy, sugary mixture. It looks like oatmeal. That mixture is called wort. W-O-R-T. We're going to take that wort down to about 85, 90 degrees or so, and then we're going to pump it over into one of our fermenters. Excuse me. Uh, we're getting ready to go check that out. All right, so once we made the wort, we pump it into one of these tanks, and this is where we add yeast. You've got to have yeast to make any type of alcohol. Yeast is a microorganism that has one job, and that job it puts off two waste products. One of them is carbon dioxide. That's why fermentation creates bubbling. It's gas. It's not boiling, it's gas. gas. That's why bread rises when you put yeast in it. The second waste product is ethanol alcohol, which is good for us. Sit in there undisturbed for three days. And during those three days, uh, the yeast will eat the sugar, convert it to alcohol. After the three days, all the sugar will be gone. It'll be about 10% alcohol by volume. We call it distiller's beer at that point. Uh, you don't want to drink it though, it's really bad. It's very sour. Uh, but once it's done, we're going to take this whole mixture, all the grains we took over there, we didn't filter them out. They're all still in here. We're going to take all of it and we'll pump it all over back into the still and then we'll start distillation. Any special yeast stirring it in? I mean, it's a specific strain, but there's nothing like proprietary or anything like that. In my opinion, in my experience, when you're making whiskey, the type of yeast you use is pretty irrelevant. Like, it doesn't have a huge impact on the flavor. <laughs> um, when you're making beer, it does. When you're making whiskey, water boils at 212 excuse me, degrees, whereas alcohol boils at 173 degrees. Okay, uh, so what happens is when we hit the temperature of the still, the alcohol evaporates. It separates from the beer, and that's when it becomes more concentrated. Now, to answer your question about copper, you always need copper in your still. Sometimes it's made entirely of copper. Sometimes it's just a portion of it like this. One of the byproducts of breaking down the grains over there during fermentation is sulfur. When you distill the beer, it concentrates the sulfur. Have you ever smelled sulfur? or drank sulfuric water, it's not good. Copper has a very high affinity for sulfur. As the, as the alcohol vapor passes through the copper, it grabs the sulfur out of the vapor and strips it. That's why you always see copper. If you didn't have copper, you'd have sulfur in your whiskey and it would be really terrible. So that's why we always, that's why you always see copper. So the alcohol vapor, once it evaporates, it passes through the cone, through the copper. It goes over into that little arm and then that little arm is going to fall down in here where it's surrounded by cold water. Cold water in this jacket surrounding that little pipe is going to condense that alcohol vapor back into a liquid. When it comes out, if you want to come over here, you look down in this tank and it comes out, this is what it looks like when it comes out. So you can see it's not crystal clear. It's called low wines. And we're going to collect them over several days. See, the 250 gallons of beer we made is only going to get us 50 gallons of low wines. All we're taking out of the beer is the alcohol. All the grain and the water is going to be left over in here. But like most distilleries, that grain is going to a local farmer to feed some livestock. After several days, we're going to have 250 gallons of low wine. So we just distill however long it takes to get that amount. So when we get 250 gallons of those low wines, we're going to take them, we're going to put them right back in the still, and we're going to run them through another distillation. 
So we redistill the low lines, and that second distillation is going to give us the stuff that goes in the barrel. Pretty much every whiskey you're ever going to drink is distilled twice, never once. That's why vodka usually goes through six to ten distillations before it ever goes in the bottle, because you want it to be neutral, right? Whereas things like whiskey, rum, and tequila usually only go through two or three distillations, because you want to preserve a lot of those oils for flavor. The second distillation is the same idea, except we have to take the stuff that comes off the still and separate it into multiple parts. See, the first little bit that comes off the still has a high concentration of chemicals in it that evaporate before alcohol, before ethanol. Mainly among them are methanol and acetone. It's going to no, make not you... Good. Not good. It's not going to kill you or anything, but you get a bad headache if you drink it. So we have to take that first little bit and let it collect into its own container. We call that first little bit the heads cut. A lot of people ask me, how do you know when the heads are done? How do you know how much to separate? That's where the art comes in. Everybody's equipment's different, everybody's inputs are different, everybody's cuts happen differently. It's up to the distiller's judgment. About, it's up to their smell and taste to make that cut. From the, the heads for us is like three or four gallons worth. We're gonna roll them off to the side, but we will come back to them. We're then gonna roll in a third, excuse me, a second container, and we're gonna start collecting the next part, which is called the hearts. The hearts is what's going in the barrel. At that point, it's mostly ethanol. It's crystal clear. It's about 150 proof. From the from that second distillation, we will get 100 gallons of hearts, which is going to fill two barrels. When it's all said and done, from just kind of start to finish, that 250 gallons of beer will end up producing about 25 gallons of hearts, which fills half of a barrel. And so, pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Now, after we get the hearts, we also have to separate the last part of that run, which is called the tails. The tails won't make you sick, and they're not that strong, but they have a very distinct musty quality, very similar to the smell you get with like a wet dog or a damp cellar. What you would be smelling are called fusel alcohols. The only type of alcohol we drink is ethanol. There's a whole different type of a group of alcohols called fusel alcohols that evaporate at higher temperatures than ethanol. That's why they come out glass. They have a very distinct and strong musty quality. If you get too many fusels in your hearts, your hearts will be ruined. So at a certain point, the distiller is gonna make that cut unless the rest of those fusels run off on their own, and that's your tails cut. It happens to the heads and the tails. We're gonna save them, and we're gonna mix them with our low wines. And then the next time we distill more low wines to get some hearts again, the heads and tails from the last batch will run through the still with them. There are, two, there are two different types of stills. The first still is what's called a pot still. Pot stills have been around for thousands of years, literally. That's what this is. It's got a pot where it evaporates and comes over into another condensing and then condenses out. The second type of still is called a column still. A column still kind of looks like this part, except it's like this big around and it's like six stories tall. The way a column still works, first of all, this is technically a hybrid between the two. This can act as both a pot still and a column still. The way the column still works is each of these valves connects to a metal plate that opens and closes. What happens is, if you say so you close these plates, this section becomes, a, becomes another mini still because the alcohol has to evaporate from here. It's going to hit this plate and then it recondenses and falls down to this plate, at which point it has to re-evaporate and come through this plate. The more plates you have closed, the higher concentration of alcohol you're going to get coming off the top because it has to go through more barriers. Okay. We do not use this at all. We keep all the plates open and we only use this as the pot still function. You could use a crate, you could use a bucket. Uh, as long as it's a new Chardo container, legally speaking, you can age bourbon in it. Uh, but I digress, everybody uses barrels. The law also doesn't specify what type of oak you have to use. But I've never seen it aged in anything other than American white oak. That's what this is. This type of wood has a very particular set of natural sugars in it. Things that are found in vanilla, cinnamon, cloves, caramel, coconuts. Now if you go down the woods and chop down a branch of white oak, those sugars aren't going to be of much use to you. Because in their natural form, they're too complex. That is the purpose of charring. Charring takes those sugars and it breaks them down. It makes them smaller. It caramelizes them. That way you can work with them. So what happens during aging is all about temperature. During the hotter months of the year, that heat makes the whiskey expand and it pushes it in the barrel where it absorbs the sugar very rapidly. During the colder months of the year, it's the opposite. The whiskey contracts and pulls out of the barrel and slows down that reaction. So that's kind of how aging works. It cycles in and out. The importance of temperature in that process is why if you go to a warehouse where they're aging bourbon, there's no climate control. 
because you want them to be exposed to those temperature switches, right? That's what makes aging happen. Uh -huh. Now, another requirement we discussed is that you're not allowed to add anything to bourbon besides uh, water, no flavorings and no colorings. When it goes in the barrel, it looks like water. It's crystal clear, but you know how it looks when it comes out. All of that color is from the barrel, nothing else. And over half of bourbon's flavor comes from the barrel, right? The reason so much flavor comes from the barrel is because it's a new barrel. That's why we have to use a new barrel every time. Similar to how if you make coffee and then reuse the coffee grounds, if you reuse a barrel, you get a very different whiskey. Now that doesn't mean it's better. Pretty much every other type of whiskey other than bourbon is aged in a used barrel. That's what makes bourbon so unique. Because it uses a new barrel, it has a very different flavor profile. And if you want to maintain that, you've got to use a new barrel every time. This is our small batch bourbon. Small batch is a term that means a blend of multiple barrels. However, small batch is not a legal term. There's no rule around it. You could blend a million barrels together and call it a small batch. And you're not required to tell people how many barrels are in your small batch. It's marketing. There's a lot of that in whiskey. Moitendizer, yeah. There's moitendizer. <laughs> yeah. You're going to see a lot of stuff on labels. You're going to see terms like private select, special reserve, extra rare. None of that stuff means anything. At the end of the day, there is only one way to determine a whiskey's quality. Can you guess? Please taste it. If you like it, it's good. If you don't like it, it's bad. And it's going to change depending on who's drinking. Anybody that tells you differently is trying to sell you something or they're a snob. And that's my philosophy. Take it or leave. Now, now, for us, a small batch, it usually corresponds with how big the distillery is. Small distilleries will have a small, small batch. Big distilleries will have a big, small batch. Um, for us, we have a small one that's usually four barrels or less, mainly because our blending tank only holds four barrels. Uh, so we take the barrels, we dump them in here. We also add water and bring them down to 100%, 50% alcohol. Our other bourbon is a single barrel bourbon. Unlike small batch, single barrel is a legal term. If you see single barrel on a bottle, what that means is that the bourbon in that bottle came from one barrel. And the reason you do that is because everyone's different. No two barrels of bourbon ever come out tasting identical. That's why blending is very important, because blending is what allows for consistent taste. It's also why single barrels are fun, because uh, we got barrel 43 up front. Next barrel's not going to taste exactly the same, so it's kind of a unique product. Now with our single barrels, we also don't add water to them. That's why they're labeled as cask strength. Have you ever seen a bottle that says the term barrel proof on it? It's the same thing. Cash strength and barrel proof are interchangeable terms. They both mean no water at Whatever proof comes out of the barrel at, that's what it gets bottled at. That proof will fluctuate, but it usually stays pretty high. Currently, the one we have in front sitting at 119.9 proof. 59.95%, uh, so feel free to have those two things make sense, the distinction? All right, last thing is bottling. First thing is to set up the labeler, which is easier said than done. But if you do it right, you just put a bottle right here, push the pedal, on goes the labels, one bottle at a time. After that, the filler will be hooked to the tank. You're going to calibrate it, and then you'll be able to fill four bottles simultaneously with the push of a button. After that, it's all manual, so the corks are all going to put on by hand. You got a bottle right here. Yeah. After, yep, just like that. Also, there's a medallion on each bottle that tells you which one it is. See, that one says single barrel cast strength. The small bag has a different one. To put that on, you put your bottle in this holder, you peel an adhesive off the metal, line it up in this groove, and then give it a good press. Once that's on, we'll put some shrink wrap around the cork and we'll use a handheld heat gun to seal it. Last thing we're going to do is we're going to write on the bottle. Each bottle's got four spaces on it. The first space is for the barrel or the batch number, depending on which one we're doing. And then you've got your age, and your ABV, and we write those in. Once that's done, you're done. The distillers are going to tell you you got to use a Kentucky limestone filtered water and all that stuff. So it does help, but it's not essential. It has nothing to do with how the bourbon tastes. It does not contribute to the taste. A more accurate term is not limestone water; it's hard water. Right. Right. So hard water is beneficial for mashing because the minerals in hard water, namely calcium and magnesium help the yeast do its job. Okay. They balance the acidity of fermentation and help it to progress smoothly. It doesn't affect the taste any. It has nothing to do with the taste, it has to do with chemical balance. <laughs> now, when you're proofing, when you're adding water to the bourbon to bring the alcohol down, that's the last thing you want to use. When you're proofing, you want to use as soft and pure of a water as you can find. Hope may, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, preferably something that's been both distilled and reverse osmosis filtered. 
We're not that fancy, so we just reverse osmosis filter. But yeah, when you're proofing, you don't want to add anything at that point. So you just want to use as pure water as you can. Had a great tour, uh, nice tasting. It's a really small facility, but only open for about five, six years. And uh, they make some good product. Uh, they're growing.